Right, morning everyone. Just need to let, let us know if you can hear us when you're logged in. So we're gonna we're gonna sit here and wait until you pop up and say hello. <laughs> we're gonna stay silent until you do. <clears throat> Someone there watching, a couple of people. Yeah. Good. All good. Brilliant. Yeah, just give us a give us a nudge, just let us know you can hear us when you uh, when you log in so then we can uh, <coughs> we can make sure we're not chatting rubbish on camera basically. That's it. Morning Phil, morning Lee. Pop your comments below, guys, just so we know you can hear us. Morning, Una. Yeah. Dusty show time. <laughs> <clears throat> so what we're going to do, we're going to, once we know that everybody can hear us, we've got a few more people coming on board because we know there's going to be about 25 to 30 people watching. So once we get, get up towards those numbers, we'll start the conversation so nobody misses out. Mike's got the questions there that you guys already asked. And if you've got questions, just type in the comments below uh, any questions that you do have so that between Mike, uh, uh, Matt and myself, we can hopefully answer your questions. Afternoon, Lee. Afternoon. This must be South Southern Hemisphere. It's definitely Australia. That yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it could be New Zealand. Where are you at the minute, Lee? Afternoon would be, would be Aussie. Yeah, it would be Aussie, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Morning, Annalise. Give us a little nudge, tell us you can hear us. New South Wales, cool. Morning, Lee. Nick Harden, all the way from Holes Early. Up early in Holes Early. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably definitely dark in Holes Early. Yanez, good man. Yeah, pop a little uh, Dave, Dave. Pop a little comment below, and let us know you can hear us before we uh, before we go too crazy. Cool. There we go. Elgin, good. We'll get cracking. We'll get cracking. So right. we're gonna yeah, we're gonna get cracking with some questions. Mike's got all the questions that everybody sent in. And if, if you get questions as we go along, then make sure you uh, pop them in make the sure comments. you pop them in the comments. We're gonna we'll just jump between questions that have been specifically directed at Matt and uh, those that have been directed at Mike and I, just so that there's a bit of uh, variation. A bit of variation in the, in the otherwise you're gonna hear us talk about nutrition and training for the whole for the first 30 minutes and then you're gonna then you're gonna hear all the interesting stuff after that so yeah uh, we're gonna jump between cool. the two so we'll start off with a question from matt smith Not that matt. <laughs> yeah uh what was the best part of breaking the world record for you and did you ever doubt it was possible yeah the the best part of breaking the world record was just the feeling of actually achieving it after yeah. a long long time chasing it and yeah definitely i mean as many positive people behind it, there was a lot of negativity behind it, which is a massive motivator for me. You know, you, you, you can't argue with it, you can only prove yeah. it wrong. Yeah. So, yes, there was definitely elements, you know, because one thing you've got to remember that, you know, it wasn't our stress again. These aren't personal vendettas, they're personal goals. And the guys that have done these records before are incredibly hard natured people, you know, they've, they've got an amazing work ethic, an amazing ability. So to, to go in there with anything other than, you know, humility is, I think, a little bit uh, a little bit bumptious. But so, yeah, there was definitely times I doubted myself. But again, you surround yourself with good people. You believe in yourself. You've done your homework and you give it everything you've got. And that's all you can do. But the sense of achievement when you've done that is, is pretty awesome. 
Go on, Mike. Fire up the next one. If I say, um, so for you, Matt, nutrition-wise, I eat lunch as quickly as possible after the second run. So if you're in, but still have to throw up a few minutes after we're into the third run. What can be done differently? What am I eating? What am I not eating? What, okay. What, what can I try, basically? So I think if the if you're throwing up, but like physically get physically thrown up after eating. Um, there's a couple of things that could be wrong there. I, the type of food that you're eating could be a little bit too fibrous, so it could be that your body's not able to actually digest it, therefore it's sitting in the gut and it's not actually being absorbed. Um, so you might want to look at what you're actually eating. Um, I think you actually mentioned in the question there that, that it was eaten quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah. As so quick the lunch is eaten quickly, which is fine. It's, it's kind of the nature of the beast. You know, you're not sat down for a free course meal, you know, having a full on. Uh, you know, table service type dinner. So you, with that in mind, you do need to think about what you're eating. So I would suggest non-fibrous types of foods, you know, even things that like maybe have been fibrous, like sweet potato, but have been mashed up. Yeah. Um, maybe looking at ideas, like maybe even banana, uh, and even make sure that the banana is ripe rather than green because it's less starchy. Yeah. So you've got the sugars are already more broken down um, and they're therefore more readily available to you um, to use. Um, I think yeah, you definitely want to get some form of protein in. So, you know, a leaner source of protein. So perhaps you know, you're still gonna have to chew it, obviously. But you've got your kind of chicken, and you've got your, your you know, those sort of easier to digest. Easier to digest. Yeah. Rather, rather like red meats, like cool on yeah, but probably not on a day when you're sharing that. Would you? Have you got anything to add on that? Like kind of I ideas you've used? Coming from where he's coming from, obviously there's an element of nervousness because you know he's going in and, and obviously working pretty hard to get worked up yeah. within two or three sheets to be sick and we all know what that's like and I found that in times of heat it's been incredibly difficult to eat and sometimes when you're struggling I cheated I used a protein shake yep because yeah. it was cool it went down easy and if it did come up easy it wasn't a horrendous thing you know yeah. pretty much you could throw up in the middle of the catching pen and not miss a beat and carry on sharing which is still not the ideal but it's better than yeah. taking any other form. And uh, you, you know, try and balance your way away from that. Substitute. Yeah, I suppose on a similar to that, you could try having a smoothie mixed up, can you? Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, if you want protein, protein, protein smoothie, shake in there, some green, you know, something green boys in there. Um, working around Europe, because it was, you know, a lot of people use an excuse for a poor diet, and it is yeah. difficult, I grant that. But you know, when you want something bad enough, you will do it. and. It, it was an easy one to carry with you. Yeah. Tin fish, and that wouldn't recommend that working hard on a hot day because that's easy to be sick. But you know, a, a tub of protein and you shake yeah. it with you. When things got bad, it was a it was a better substitute than a bad diet. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Uh, guys, just a comment just come in that you can't hear us that well. So can you just um, double check that? Can you just pop in the comments below if you can hear us? Um, <clears throat> I think it's Lee. Yeah, you said you can't hear us very well. So can you just? The rest of you guys, can you just make a little comment below and just let us know if you can hear us? Because obviously, uh, yeah, it's not much point in us talking away if you guys can't hear us yeah. that well. Just pop it in the comments below. We'll wait for you guys just to put a comment in. Like I can see Stanley. Morning, Stanley from uh, Westy. You can hear us. Can you just type in the comments, mate? Just let us know you can actually hear us. I can hear you fine, Matt. It's uh, Matt's a bit quiet. Okay, so we just need to basically <coughs> speak Talk up. We need to shout a bit. <laughs> right. Okay, uh, cool. Shall we go? Next question. <clears throat> Next question. Uh, for Matt, for a young cheer wanting to learn things and make a serious career, what things should I be investing in early on in my career? So kind of starting out, what should they invest in? Yeah, it's, 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 a di it's difficult to learn shearing with poor equipment. That's granted, and I'm not going to grind an axe for anything, but definitely don't skimp on equipment. If you know, a grinder is an incredibly good investment. Um, learning how to use that properly is a bigger <laughs> investment. And there's a lot of good people. You know, good shearers will help you. You know, um, if you're ever in the neighbourhood, look us up. We're more than happy to help you. But one of the biggest investments that you can make to make your life easier and make everything else around that benefit you is your gear. You know, it is basically putting your time into it. Having your own grinder, it seems like a massive investment at the start of it. But I can assure you, it pays for your, it pays for itself very quickly. I'm still running on the same grinder. I use the same grinder when I, that I bought when I was 15 years old. It was the same grinder we ground on for the record, and that has paid for itself a lot of times over. 
Hydration wise, I drink as much water as possible, about four litres up until lunchtime, but still get the feeling that it's not enough. Uh, sweat a lot, um, but I struggle to keep hydrated um, and use this fizzy drink as well. But what would you say? So, drinks four litres up to lunchtime, it doesn't feel like it's enough, sweats like a lot, never feels hydrated. What would you? Your input on that. Yeah, I think you and I will probably, yeah. I'll, I'll probably bounce that back to you in a minute as well. But um, I think probably from a <clears throat> from a hydration perspective, it's very individual. So that's the first thing I'd say. You can get a you can get a kind of blanket idea of how much water you should be drinking as a general rule. You know, if we're dealing with people sort of just from a health perspective, we're giving them general guidelines as to how many liters they should be drinking based on their body weight. Okay, that in itself gives you a rough guide. Okay. Um, I guess it's a bit like calories for, for us all. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You know, there's some there's some things that we can give a general rule on, and then you've got individual variability. So you've got people's sweat rates vary massively. Some people lose a lot of sweat, so they look like they're sweating a lot, but they're not losing a lot of salt. Yeah. 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 And then you get some people who don't look like they're sweating much, but they're losing quite a high lot of high ratio of electrolytes. Yeah. So it, in in just drinking water, that may be the problem. So if you're drinking just like four four liters of water. It sounds like an awesome amount of water to be drinking, but what you could almost be doing is dehyd like flushing yeah, the cells out. Because yeah. hydration is not just water. It's if you're a, if you're a, lose a lot of salts and sodium content when you're sweating, then you're almost diluting kind of just by taking on water, you're diluting that level within the body even further. So it's not it's not the ideal thing to have, is it? It's, no. um, so I think probably from for the person that's asked that question, the my message to you is probably. Try something different uh, that's not too far away from what you're doing. So like four litres of water, but maybe add an electrolyte tablet to each 500 mils, yeah? yeah. Or each litre, depending on what, yeah. what, the, what the guidance is on it. We, you know, we use or we have used with people uh, precision hydration. Yeah. Find their, yeah. We find their product really good. Um, and I've used them across different sports as well. So, you know, people who play tennis, people who play rugby, people who play, who do triathlon, uh, obviously amongst the Shearing fraternity, there's a number of people now who use that product, uh, and I know there's a few guys on this call already um, because I can see them on here. Will, one of them, who really, really uh, yeah. likes that. So, your body will tell you the, the electrolytes, it's probably a good idea to have the two together because yeah. you can get a little bit sick balance, finding your balance with the electrolytes, yeah. and to be able to just go back to straight water is, is a, is a yeah. good thing while you're getting started. Um, I think. A good thing to add on that is amount wise, so it's four litres, where is it, where are we, four litres up till lunch. Um, that's probably about the right sort of volume, isn't it? You know, if you're doing, an if you're start, day, yeah, if you're four, starting at, well, obviously heat dependent. Yeah, yeah that's a good. but like you, you got to think of it as in your body can't really tolerate more than a litre an hour. So yeah. there's no point drinking more than a litre an hour. Obviously you can, you want to keep drinking through your breaks, but if you're doing a two hour run, there's two litres, half an hour off. You might put back three quarters of a litre, another two hours. At most, like by the time you finish your second run of an eight hour day, you might be at five litres. Um, that's pretty much the most you can tolerate, but worth probably noting just to make sure you're very well hydrated before you start. So you make sure you have a drink before you start, you're hydrated the evening before, you're drinking plenty. Um, so you're not starting the day dehydrated and then always trying to catch up. Um, Cause you're never gonna, you're never gonna catch up if you're sweating like, yeah. Like you're gonna, yeah. Um, so I think just to sort of round that question up a little bit as well is just to give you an idea, 125 mils every seven and a half minutes, okay, gives you a liter an hour. All right, so every seven and a half minutes, you take on 125 mils. How you decide to do that is entirely up to you, and obviously practicalities within certain shared environments may mean that you have to have it in a bottle with a lid on it, and you have to maybe mark on the bottle. 125 mils so you can do that but then the next thing you could do is you could have two bottles like matt said you could have one bottle with your electrolytes yeah. one bottle with your water or one bottle of electrolytes one bottle of energy drink whatever you whatever your kind of preference is because remember this is this is individual um and you've got those 125 mil markers on your bottle yeah and then you come in you have a drink okay um you know more often than not you're not doing a record so you have got time to just check yeah, that you've check how not much drunk you've too drunk. much so yeah yeah, definitely. Right, yeah, good idea. It's, 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 you're going to figure it out as you go forward, but I do think electrolytes are going to solve a lot of issues. Uh, yeah. Um, sorry, let's have a look. Um, so Matt, 
If you didn't do the world record at nine hour strong wall, is there any other record you'd fancy doing? Yeah, there was. Um, commitments and time for me are, are past now, but I mean, as when you're growing up and you're, you're surrounded by good people, and I was really fortunate, we had a lot of, you know, even you know, working alongside brother, um, and with other various very good sharers that were all very motivated. Yeah, I mean, there's always that element of <clears throat> challenge when you're that nature of person. So yeah, I mean, there was a point I used to, I spent a lot of time around the world sharing. I used to share for nearly four to five months on my own. So um, yeah, I like the fine walls. I really enjoyed the fine walls. Um, I see the record now has been put at a pretty, well, it always has been a very admirable point, but for me now, it's definitely not an option, but yes, there was definitely things I would love to have tried. Especially knowing what I know now. The eight, so, hour, the eight hour record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we won't we'll let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, so Matt, uh, when shearing it seems that my muscles just fade away no matter how much or good quality protein and greens I eat. So that's pretty much what should I be eating yep. to maintain my muscle mass during the, the busy season. Yeah. I think this is a really good question. Um, and one that I think people do overthink a little bit. Yeah. Um, the one thing I'll say right from the start is you can't manage what you don't measure. Okay, so if you are 12 stone at the start of the season, and by the end of the season you're 11, and you've only weighed yourself once during that period, there's your problem, right? Because you can't expect yeah. to... It's too late then, once you're... Yeah. yeah. You're 12 stone at the start of the season, and shit. Right, I get the day before the end of the season and I haven't weighed myself and I look, look, oh jeez, I'm like, I've lost a lot of condition. So at the start and the end of, uh, if it's not every day, every other day, I mean, it really yeah. should be every day because then you can manage that at the end of that day, you can go, right, okay, not so I've, enough, today yeah. I've lost five pounds. Okay, so why did I lose five pounds? Maybe tomorrow I'll try and drink a little bit more fluid and I'll have yeah. something slightly different. So that's the first thing. On that, I think you probably want to make sure that you're uh, eating enough more. I mean, you mentioned protein and greens, great. That definitely needs to be part of any diet, but you haven't talked anything about carbs and you really need to get carbohydrates in. Carbohydrates are gonna be what delivers the proteins to the cells, okay? So to a musk, a cellular level in the muscles, you need to deliver the energy. If you think of the carbs as like your, your cars, okay? They're driving the energy to the cells. Um, and if you haven't got them, then your body's gonna draw from its reserves at, yeah. at that site. Because, because of the nature of what you do, you're not, it's not like you're sat at a desk all day and your body can, the demand for energy is low, the demand for energy is high, so therefore the fuel needs to be readily available. And if you're not taking on regular amounts of carbohydrate, you will dip into those stores that you've got. All right, now, great if you want to lose body fat, okay? Not great if you want to preserve muscle. Yeah. yeah. All right, so to give you a little bit more on that, like, yeah, it's provide obviously everybody's individual, but provided you're not intolerant to any of these 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 types of foods, you know, porridge oats for breakfast, okay, you know, small amount, however much you can handle. Mashed potato, um, you know, I prefer not to use wheat-based products just because they're not great for the gut. And we've just talked about hydration. Yeah. If you if you're eating things like bread and pasta, they're not ideal in the gut really from a hydration perspective either because you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna lose hydration you're gonna become dehydrated just by potentially if you're intolerant to wheat there's gonna be an issue yeah. in the gut. Yeah. So we've got that. Um, protein wise. Protein to eat again that comes back to the early question. Yeah possible protein shake or chicken something easily digestible. Yeah. Um, and eating those bigger forms of protein that do yeah. take a long period of time to break down you know, the evening before. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, that's the time yeah. to have your red meat or your yeah. eating or whatever. Um, also probably protein at breakfast is quite a good one. Yeah. That you might not think about if you've got your porridge or something, you want some sort of protein that's gonna set you up for the day rather than thinking, oh, not really at a lot of protein in the evening where I'll give you five steaks and knock it out. If you just <laughs> keep your protein spread out so every time you're stopping, what you're eating is protein and carbs based. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, did I want to be answer the question? Because he's where are we? Yeah. The... Yeah. Muscles just seem to fade away. So I think increase of protein, carbohydrate. Yeah. Increase the volume. Yeah. And measure it, but you can't. Yeah. It comes back to that first point, really. You can't. 
we, we can't complain about a result yeah. we haven't we haven't no we yeah, haven't even if it's only loosely measured to think it's right <coughs> that's roughly a cupful of a certain amount or that protein amount is about the size of my fist or something like that just some it don't you don't have to think okay there's 28 grams of yeah. protein just have a look at it and be aware of thinking that is that this amount uh, and write it down as well if you really are struggling yeah. honestly just write it down because then that gives you okay monday i ate that and at the end of the day i weighed this tuesday i ate this and at the end of the day i weighed it because if this is your problem this is the most important thing so yeah. uh make it important and, and, and manage it i think yeah. cool. uh, so matt i see you're now farming venison what other areas of agriculture do you draw inspiration from what other areas in terms of from the farming or from in the shearing world? The way I, I guess that would probably be from the farming point of view. Or would well, you I mean, I, the way, yeah, the way I interpreted it was like, are there other areas of agriculture that you think you, you see things being done? Is there anything specific? Is it? Yeah, yeah. I guess perhaps I think, just I think the whole, the... everything comes through to integrity. Yeah. You know, you, you follow through every <coughs> aspect, every avenue and what you're trying to do in life with a high level of integrity and humility but i think that the level of growth that i've found best is appreciating other people's strengths and weaknesses and working with those and, and working with them and in the sharing world to the farming world it's no different and we're both some areas very good at it some areas very bad at it and again farming some of us work together and we grow at a, at a rate of knots that's really great um and others work so hard at working away from everybody else they stay stagnant and we're, we're the same in the sharing and i was fortunate i was really fortunate but i also seek sought and found the people that i really or tried to i didn't get to work with everybody that i would love to have, but you know you look at the people that are doing things better than you and 99 percent of the time they're good humble people and if you and probably shy if you ask them the question they will happily help you um so i think the, 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 the level of, of growth is where you choose to take it and it's trying to identify the people that you can work with that have the things that you feel that you would really like to be like or get better at and work with them basically and that doesn't happen without you know sort of either swallowing pride or getting over your shyness and just remember like don't mistake arrogance for shyness just because they're not there running around introducing themselves to everybody doesn't mean that they're not approachable yeah. yeah. Should we? Cool. There's a couple of questions that have yeah, come in. Should we we'll do them? We'll come back to those as well. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, Eileen was the first one. Yeah. Okay, so Eileen's question. Um, evening, Eileen. Not sure. Uh, so, I struggle with my low carb diet because I'm currently living at the shearing camp where we have a cook. Do you think I should eat carbs but just less of the calories? <clears throat> do you think I should eat carbs? Less calories. I think that really depends on what kind of what she's aiming to do. Like, because if she's got a low carb diet, is that because she sits better, like she performs better on a more fats based diet, mm -hmm. or because she's you know wanting to keep her weight down, or yeah, like that's going to be the that's going to be the the key thing, isn't it? Really, with that. Eileen, if you're still on if you're still on the call, just um, pop a little comment below and just give give us a little bit more, yeah info on why you've gone low carb and, and or perhaps what you what you consider low carb because we could we can have a little discussion that's a little bit more targeted around that for you uh, so pop that in the comments below we'll go to the next question and we'll come back to that one um i really apologize if i get this if i say this wrong um anaru yeah would you say yeah yeah anaru wakefield uh what's the best advice you can give to a shearer senior shearer practicing for 12 sheep finals well i'm going to pass that straight to matt <laughs> it's been a long time since I was there. Um, your preparation in the shed is everything, and I think you know you can talk to Roland. And if you're not doing it every day at work, um, which some of us have, you know, got a bigger mortgage and use that as an excuse not to focus, maybe as much as we should. But you know, you should be treating every sheep. Um, so a twelve sheep final, you should be starting the run after lunch as a twelve sheep final, and trying to do that as well. As possible in this mentally similar environment as possible you know 12 sheep as quickly as realistically possible as well as possible using the gear that you should be using in the shows you know there's no point in going and using 
certain shed gear, people say shed gear and show gear, you know, there, there probably shouldn't be a lot of difference. I know that there's points and bits and pieces we've got to get into that aren't always practical in the shed. Um, but trying to make it as like as possible, you know, every day, every day is a school day. Um, so that would be my biggest thing. Make, make what you want to achieve on the weekend your focus for the five day week as much as possible. Gear, mental intensity, um, physical intensity, and then on the weekend you will that will follow through to your to your ability to cope with that twelve sheet final. Great. Uh, so coming back to Eileen's question is uh, is to lose lose body fat. Yeah. All right. So I think again, like you you want to measure it, like what Matt was saying, so you know at the start of your day and the end of the day how you're doing. If you're losing body fat and then but and somebody's cooking for you, you could perhaps go slight. Because you know, if you're working hard shearing eight hours a day, you'll probably, it's hard to understand it, but you, you could probably get away with more carbs, than, well, you definitely could get away with more carbs than you could on a, on a day when you're not shearing that heavy. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think the, the, the probably the one point to make around this question, I think, as well, just to help you best, is um, low-carb diets are are popular, I guess, in terms of losing body fat, but they're yeah. not the only way. Um, <clears throat> because we know that we can actually burn, we can burn body fat with a level of carbohydrates present. The thing you've got to marry up is <clears throat> your performance and losing body fat at the same time. Um, now, I think during, uh, during, the, during the amount of hours that you will be doing shearing, there's plenty of scope for burning calories. Um, so I think you'll probably create the deficit you want to create just in the, in, off the back of doing the amount of work you do. Um, just to give you another example, like so when I'm doing triathlon, I actually eat more and I can yeah. lose body fat. Like just 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 on the basis of the fact that when I'm in a hard block of training, I can actually I don't need not not to worry is not the right way to say it, but I don't need to think too hard about trying to create a deficit because you're kind of doing that anyway. So what you've got to be careful of is you're not trying to create a deficit with your calories. Uh, and also then hindering your performance. So when what happens then is you end up with higher stress levels, okay? Now what stress, when we talk about it, everybody thinks, oh, you know, I've just been like kicked by a sheep, or I've just been, you know, just been knocked over by a car. Not that kind of stress. I'm talking about like emotional stress and stress at like a hormonal level. Stress. So cortisol yeah. levels, so your stress hormone goes through the roof. And when you do that, then you're more, you are better at storing fat. You become more efficient at storing fat. So this whole thing is about, creating health uh, because you need to be healthy first and foremost before we worry about whether or not it's low carb, high fat, high carb, low, you know, yeah. low protein, whatever, whatever form, form of that you want to do. Um, so first and first thing I'd say to you is make sure that you're, look at your anxiety level, look at your stress level, make sure you're not by going low carb creating a problem yeah. in itself because you will, if your cortisol levels are high, you just won't burn body fat, right? So health and keeping stress levels as low as possible is really important. Um, then I would say probably from from there on I would say right okay so the quality of the carbohydrates. Yeah, I was going to say perhaps look at the quality of the food yeah. you're getting over necessarily what it is because you're you're much better off having good quality natural whole carbohydrate than you are going low carbohydrate but it will be in processed and it will be in rubbish. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 on that as well processed meats. Yeah? yeah. So I'd rather you add like good quality sweet potato or like you know some brown rice and quinoa mixed in together. Than, than uh, you know, opting for a low a lower carb, so you know, pasta or yeah. you know something like spaghetti or something like that that's very poor quality, and then having processed meats with yeah. it because you kind of yeah you're negating yeah. the benefits of both. Yeah. So hopefully that helps a bit. If you don't, I'd say don't worry too much so long as your body fat is dropping, like when you're in the shearing mid shearing season. Yeah. I think that's probably the round it up. And yeah. yeah, and I think as well, when you say you want to lose body fat, you want to know <clears throat> how much you want to lose because otherwise you're kind of, you're not really, you don't really know where you're going. So yeah. you've got like, you've got this kind of thing over your head hanging over you. Like it's like someone who says they're going to start training on Monday. Like they've got that hanging over them until they start training on Monday. Okay, and if they don't start training on Monday, they're starting the next Monday. So it's the same with body fat. Like if you want to lose body fat, right, how much do you need, how much do you think you need to lose? Okay, so if it's 10%, well, Maybe it's realistic for you to lose, you know, one, one and a half percent a month, okay? Yeah. yeah, so therefore that's going to take me, you know, seven to ten months, okay? At the end of each month, I have a little check, see how I'm getting on, but micro, 
wise. Like each day, I'm having a little look to see if I'm losing, if I've lost weight. If I haven't lost weight, okay, that's fine. Doesn't matter. You, let's have a little look at the waist measurement because that'll be a really good indication. Yeah. All right. So you, you got to like think like okay, I do want to lose body fat, but do I want to? You know, how much do I want to lose? Work reverse engineer it really. Yeah. And then within that, then you set yourself smaller goals. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, hope that helps. If it, if you if we've not hit the point there or not giving you enough information, just write a comment. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to get back to me? Oh, there's some more questions coming in. Okay. So, okay, Dylan. Hey mate. How you doing? Um, what was your routine, sleep, food, training, shearing, etc. Four, six, eight weeks out from your record? And that's obviously from that. Yeah. Yeah. So <coughs> I just took these guys' advice predominantly. Um, the biggest thing, and I think it was a conversation Roly and I had, was definitely balancing your rest. It's crucial you don't run the race day before race day, which I have definitely done and was actually lining up to do before the last one. Um, six to eight week period, you know, really focused on, on the finer points of the diet. And if you haven't done the bulk of the work by that point, you are going to struggle. You know, at that point, it's managing everything, isn't it? Yeah. Really? And that was where we really struggled because here it was a, it was, it is difficult. And, you know, I don't know if you've Sean and, and um, Britt and Dylan, but it's very difficult to get a, a, a farmer motivated to start early in the morning and then have a consistent format throughout the day, which is especially what we're going on to in the record situation. You know, that's one thing we've been grateful for in New Zealand and Australia. You know, you can you can train your body to quite set hours. So that was something I struggled with and I tried to do that as much as possible. Um, and for me, it was manage, so getting towards the work, the record for me, the dates was getting, we were running out of sheep in our area in Britain for sure. And I didn't want to travel because it was going to get more difficult for diet, it was going to get more difficult for training. So it was utilizing the sheep that I did have as well as possible, you know, just trying to make sure all the T's were crossed and all the I's were dotted on a physical level, on a mental level, and, and also because, you know, I was playing farmer at the same time until Rolly got over, um, it was it was a very difficult juggling act. But yeah, just time management and rest management. Mm -hmm. really. I think sort of four points to your question there really Dylan. Sleep, food, training, shearing. Matt's just explained the shearing. Um, sleep deep in the sleep, eight hours. Sleep eight yeah, yeah, eight hours. I mean you were I mean there was one exception like during that probably that period where probably the one of the best things that happened, uh, where there was a slight sort of error I guess, um, on, on the sleep. You can't <laughs> operate on three hours a night okay. during that period of time. Yeah. I wasn't gonna tear strips into him on the video about that. <laughs> but yeah. I think you if you if you're at any doubt of how important sleep is, do three hours sleep and try going to a show the next day and see how you get on. And then, then you then you know, eh? Yeah, definitely. Like yeah. it's it's balancing. Like and you guys were a big push for that. You know, if you're tired, and I would talk to these guys a lot and got over my pride and the fact that you couldn't kill me with training. Although these, you know, I try come close. Yeah. Um, you know, it was coming in, and if I'd had a bad night's sleep, you know, obviously we had a little one, we had a lot going on on the farm, I wasn't just sharing, I was, you know, obviously his father was out helping, but, you know, reasonable size and a lot of a lot of new investment happening. So um, it was coming in and saying, look, guys, you know, I'm, I am actually a little bit buggered today, and, and then you guys would manage around that. And it's having a trainer that has that ability and intelligence to know that, you know, we're not just training. We're not nine to five in it and coming in and training. You know, we're, we're living a pretty busy lifestyle and an intense workload outside. And sometimes that's more, sometimes that's less, weather dependent, season dependent. But it, it's having somebody that, you know, you can come in and say, and not, not take the easy route, because that's pretty easy. Sometimes you're just tired and not really tired. But saying, look, you know, I do feel a little bit fatigued and, and managing your training around that. And some points, if you're really, really buggered, and I, I know it happened a couple of times, but yeah. I'm just shattered, I'm gonna use this two hours and, and I'm gonna carry on sleeping, you know, because that's what that was the best fix for the, for the situation. Yeah, yeah, I think knowing, knowing your body and paying attention to it, definitely from a sleep point of view, so like Matt said, sometimes training is not the best thing to do. If, you're, if you've had two hours sleep and you get up and you're gonna go and train and think, I've got to train, actually, you're probably better off just going back to bed for another two or three mm -hmm. hours. And that um, did happen a couple of yeah. times. Yeah. And also, if you're if you're pretty fatigued, coming doing some some more mobility or some quite low volume training is going to be a lot more beneficial than coming in thinking right, I've got two twenty minute AMRAPs to do as hard as possible. So that 
a little bit of a reactiveness because you can't always, you know, you've got your plan, but if, you know, as such, if your athlete is not in prime condition to do that, you're better off changing it and doing something constructive rather than, uh, yeah. rather than just kind of flogging a dead horse at that mm. point. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, that's the sort of um, sort of specifically training wise, Dylan. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you you you're well versed on training yourself, but. Uh, you know, near the near the end, Mike. We were, how would you describe? So the... probably like four to six weeks out, when possible, there was like quite you know quite a decent volume of some longer intervals. Yeah. I mean, again, this is the this is that's probably the hardest point that we had in terms of managing the workload because you're wanting you know four to six weeks out, you're wanting the training to be quite a big workload. We had some yeah. like some big sessions, um, yeah. but also so that you know if you're good, then going for some kind of some muscular endurance, some long, we did some longer, like 45 minute rounds of solid work just to get used to that bulk of work. But equally from the strength point of view, unless we used actually sometimes when Matt was not kind of not on top form, but just some really low reps, but to keep the strength up, you know, so twos and threes of reps. So you might've come in and only done 20 or 30 reps in the whole session with some mobility, but just to keep that maximal strength up that you're gonna need. So they always had like a little underlying muscular like strength element, but kind of just a lot, quite a bit of volume at that point. Yeah. Um, I think the, the probably the message, un, overlying message there is the fact that it's specific. Yeah. So, you know, like if you know that you're going to be lifting, you know, 55 to 65. Oh, I mean, the biggest you on a day was 76 kilos. So, I thought Rolly wasn't very good on the draft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you've got, you've got, you kind of know roughly how yeah. heavy your sheep are going to be. So you need to get very efficient at lifting that and multiples of that. So, like, you know, sometimes we calculate the amount of weight needed to be lifted and you, and you then lift that amount of weight in that amount of time. And yeah. that creates a volume load uh, situation where you can, then, you can then replicate it. I think, you know, for you guys as well as myself, like I've obviously done a record before and done a, a lot more wrong than right, um, but it was a great learning curve. And, and coming in here, you know, as, as open-minded as everybody was, which was the biggest pleasure I had coming into this environment was, you learned a lot when we went into Rollies, and I did. I, from a farming point of view, from a preparation point of view, Roland will tell you, you know, the little bits that we could tweak on that side of things, you know, just just little things, um, you know, with the point of feeding, point of weaning, point of everything, but then, you know, the training balance, and I think you guys will both acknowledge that, you know, Roland and I are both very, very different in our yeah. strengths and weaknesses and abilities to train uh, in certain areas. Yes. So, and it's identifying those. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So hopefully that answers your question, Dylan, mate. If it doesn't, or if you want to ask anything else, just comment below. Um, food, I think we've probably covered. Uh, yeah. I think anything specifically, Matt, food-wise, before we move on to the next question? You can learn a lot about the food that, um, you know, how you feel on certain foods. And, and for me, it was definitely how I felt on proteins, um, what form of protein I was eating on the meat level. So for me, I found, and I love meat and I know I knew, I knew I needed a lot of red meat prior so that was it was where I put that into the preload and what I chose to eat the night before and for me personally function exceptionally well on fish on a clarity so I, I, I had a, a massive amount of salmon the night before and you start with an amazing clearness in your head whereas if I'd had a massive steak the night before though I would have been full of energy felt a little bit not quite sure. Yeah, just a bit seedy, you know, like a, like a slight touch of hangover if you, and, that, and that's where you, when you've got to that level of fitness, you can really feel yeah. what food yeah. does what to you and do that work a long way out. You know, you don't want to be trying to figure that out the week before. It's like, oh shit, yeah. what form of protein am I, am I starting the day on better? And for yeah. me, it was personally fish, but it could be different for other people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And actually, like the difference for some people between three eggs and four eggs for breakfast like it's the difference between feeling hungry at 11 a.m. and the difference between feeling hungry at one. So mm. when you get to know that, uh, yeah. you, you, you really you really can fine tune how you feel. And going back to what we've said a few times already, you can manage stuff because yeah. you've, you've kind of got a bit more, you're a bit more clued in. Uh, Jimmy Samuels, morning mate. Uh, Mr. Fly. Yeah, morning Jimmy. How's it team? I'm pretty keen on taking the step, next step in my shearing career, giving myself a chance at records possibly. I know you three are probably the best people to ask. For the last couple of years, I've worked hard on getting my gear right with my pattern, and I'm confident in those aspects of my shearing, but my fitness and mental toughness are letting me down. So my question is, what's the next step from here? Okay, so 
Mike's just heard me ask that. I'm gonna I'll pass that to Mike so he can give you maybe a, a couple of ideas. I guess really on gaining momentum, Mike, isn't it? Yeah, really? I think. you're probably gonna want to start with something consistent, like so. I was gonna say, like one thing I was thinking today is fitness-wise, the biggest thing to be is consistent. Mm -hmm. Like people will start and they'll do something and then they'll stop and they'll start again and you'll get, not really get anywhere. Your best bet is that you could do something consistently well, will get the best results over doing something half-hearted. Yeah. Um, depends where you're at. So I'm trying to think with Jimmy, whether he's... I think Jimmy, for, for, for you, mate, I mean, I've the benefit yeah. of knowing you a little bit, I would say the best thing you could start off with doing is, because you, you seem fairly nimble to me when you're on yeah, the... Yeah, quick. Yeah, you're quick. So I'd say for me, like when I, whenever I've seen you, I think just, just purely just a basic level of conditioning, maybe start off doing two or three sessions where it's mobility based on the days where you have a harder day. So you're preparing your body for the next day. And then a couple of sessions a week where maybe you go do some more conditioning, some, some shorter intervals. Um, it's a long game, I guess, trying to prepare for a record. You know, you, you've known Matt for longer than we have you'll know how long he's prepared for doing those yeah. sorts of things and you know how long you've been involved in the game already. So you've done a lot of that kind of shearing preparation probably already. What we need to do now is think about, right, how can we get you in better condition? So uh, yeah. we would talk from a general fitness wise, what we call general preparedness, okay? So we get you ready generally, yeah? yeah. And then we, we also- Generally stronger, generally more supple, you're able to move better, yeah. um, got a better base, I mean, if you're busy doing eight hours a day, six days a week, then you're gonna have a pretty good cardiovascular base. Like, you know, but some, so just get stronger, general fitness better, and then you can start to look, okay, what record are we doing? Should you, lambs, what yeah. weights are we talking about? Um, Matt, I don't know if you've well, got well from a mental aspect, Jimmy, I mean, I know I'm difficult, because like yourself, you know, like I've, I've struggled to back myself when probably, and definitely probably more like yourself, you've proved yourself time and time again, especially in speed share. So you have everything there. You have that mental ability because I don't believe you don't, you couldn't do what you do. You know, you dominate the sharing, the speed share world at the moment, which is brilliant to see. So I think, you know, it is a collaboration. We are happy to help. I believe you can do it. And it's getting that into your head and getting, you know, the start date you know, day one or one day, that's that's pretty much it really. And when you decide to do that and you talk to these guys and if you want to talk to me, you know me, mate, happy to help. Yeah. And I do believe you can do it. So it's just getting that getting that thought process, getting where you want to be, come and talk about ideas, you know, if it's about what, what particular type of record you want to start with or if you feel there's only one that you really want to do and how to go about that. And, and then after we've had that conversation, then these guys, they know their stuff, you know, and then put that into play. And the thing that you'll develop when you when you start this is the feeling of when you do get that level of fitness and you do have that level of understanding, you will develop that confidence. And you're not going to jump up and down and shout about it and we're going to smash this record and we're going to do that. You know, you, you, you've got it in your head, that strength that you are going to at least give it everything you've got. You know, so I, um, if you're going to go ahead, mate, I'd, I'd love to be helpful. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh... Ash, I struggle when I'm not working. I find myself eating every two hours and tend to gain <laughs> unnecessary weight. Uh, mate, you just love food. It's cool. Don't <laughs> yeah. uh, just, trying work, to find, just work more. Don't yeah. stop. Trying to find a balance between my work eating habits and how I eat through my own downtime is a real struggle. That is a really, really good question. And that's something that not just shearers would struggle with. Like I know there are certain shearers who do like farm work you know, more often at certain times of the year and then share more at certain times of the yeah. year. So you've got that, you've got, that's a very real situation that I think you'll probably find more people in your fraternity. Yeah, I think, I suppose as a general rule, you could look at um, something that we use, very general, but if you're busy shearing, go for protein and carbs. Mm -hmm. If you're not shearing, then kind of drop the carbs down and have your diet more protein and fat based. Yeah. Um, so kind of, you know, if you're getting, if you're getting hungry every couple of hours, it could partly be your body's just in a habit of that. Mm. Um, you know, if you're used to eating every two hours religiously, your body's just gonna want to keep doing that. So perhaps look at what you can change around that. Lower the carbohydrate down. And um, a big drink of water for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Okay, drink, make sure you're hydrated. Yeah, make sure you're hydrated. Nutritionist. Um, yeah, yeah. 
But what well, I was just going to say there as well is that you, the other thing you could try, I don't know if you're aware of it, is intermittent fasting. So on the days where you're not shearing, give your body a chance to have a break because what will happen, your nervous system becomes like almost like, you know, that fight and flight symptom that we have. It becomes very uh, sort of on edge because basically you're telling it that every two hours it needs to react to something going into it food wise. So intermittent fasting, you have your last meal between 6 and 8 p.m. Yeah, and then the next day you don't eat until 12. Um, the idea of that is not necessarily to reduce the overall calorie intake throughout the rest of that day. It may actually happen just in virtue of the fact that you've not eaten for potentially two, from what you're saying, potentially even three times. Yeah, because you're eating yeah. every two hours, you could have had one at sort of seven, nine, and 11 or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I think intermittent fasting could work for you. But I will just say on that, when you do that, you need to make sure your diet is well, well dialed in because if you try an intermittent fast and you've only got ice cream in the house, that you're having ice cream at 12 o'clock because that's what's gonna, you're gonna get hungry. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you need to try it and definitely don't try this on a day where you've got a busy, you've either had a hell of a day the day before or you're, you're, you're gonna have a, uh, you're gonna go shearing. Do not do not do that on a shearing day, um, mm. okay? Yeah. So now I'll make sure I'm really clear on that. Yeah. All right, food quality high on a low, low energy demanding day. All right, um, hopefully that helps with that. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, okay, that's cool, Jimmy. Yeah, I mean, you, mate, seriously, just pop the mobility questions below, unless it's a really personal question that you don't want to share, that's absolutely fine. But if you have got it, because there's probably about 1,500 people in this group who need the same help. Yeah. So, so yeah. don't be afraid to put that down below. Uh, uh, I'll just go back up here. Uh, Alan Smith. <laughs> Portion control. Matt. Okay, so Alan, just pop below like maybe anything else around portion control that you, you want to know more about. Um, Mike alluded to earlier in the conversation about some general guidelines that we, you could use in terms of portion sizes of like how to look at your plate and go, right, that's the right amount of carbohydrates or a general rule, yeah. uh, protein and fats. Do you want to um, go through that, Mike? So a really simple way of doing it is if you, this is probably the easiest way for most shearers to do. If you're out shearing, use your hand as your guide for something like for what you're going to eat. Um, so carbohydrate wise it's going to vary so you'll have to play with it a little bit but look at a fist size amount of carbohydrates if you're if this is per meal ideally so if you're shearing you might even want to go with two fists of yeah. carbohydrate yeah. um so this is perfect to vary if you're not shearing and you've got your meal one fist size amount of kind of good quality carbs if you're shearing two fist size amount um protein wise something the size of your palm um there if you want to go again if you're if you're shearing, it's a bit of a funny one because you don't, you can almost overeat on the protein and sit a bit heavy, but at, as a minimum, something the size of your palm, so your chicken breast, something like that during the day, steak in the evening. If you're, you might even, if you're busy shearing, you might go two palm size amount of protein, um, see how you feel, just play with it a little bit. Um, fats wise, an amount smaller, so kind of the size of your thumb or kind of two thumbfuls. Yeah. Um, so it's very much, they, those are kind of the, some loose guidelines, um, tweak it a little bit, depending. so if you're wanting to put on weight, you're gonna go with more carbohydrate. Um, if you're wanting to lose weight, then you might go with less carbohydrate or you might go slightly more fats if you if you feel good on that. Um, kind of veg wise, two well, fists, the, I mean two the, fists four. Yeah, I mean the veg, and the four. veg, again, on your, if, you, if, if you are gonna opt for a slightly lower carbohydrate option, one yeah. easy way of doing that is just to swap out something that's a little bit more starchy. So if you say take the potato out and put broccoli in, because yeah. vegetables are carbohydrates, okay? That's that's something that we all, we often forget. Yeah, so perhaps um, just to simplify that a little bit, if you had a, like more of a, a complex carbohydrate, so something that is almost pure, like quite high carbohydrate, often we'll just like palm size amount. So if you're using yeah. rice, a palm size amount of rice, and then go for the fist of like your veggies, vegetables and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's gonna be good. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, probably as you get, as you probably listen to this conversation, everything, we have some general guidelines and then we have built around that more specificity 
given the person that we're that's in front of us. So you nobody knows your body better than you, Alan. So if you know that you're, you're you feel really good when you have slightly higher carbs for breakfast, okay, and you don't start craving foods, then you, you you've got to listen to your body in that respect. Yeah, I think as your goal, isn't it? It's specific to your goal. One person's goal might be to maintain their weight during the shearing season. Another might be thinking, right, so now's a good chance to lose a little bit of weight. So what you're eating, whilst you still want to fuel for your performance, is going to be slightly different. Yeah. Or it could be vastly different if you've got two different goals, two different body responses. Yeah. Um, Hopefully yeah. that helps, mate. Obviously, you can just pop pop down any more comments you've got. Yeah. Uh, over in April. Oh, yeah. yeah, he's over in April. Yeah, we'll book, book it, Matt's book you in. <laughs> Booked in, yeah. <laughs> um, Stanley, hello, mate. Uh, hi guys, Matt, well done on your talk at Oxford the other day. Um, my my life for my wife and I is about to change. We're expecting our first child. Uh, can I train any time of the day or night or does it have to be early in the morning? Okay, so really good question. The bottom line, the, the simple answer is no, you can train whenever you want. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is some speculation as to whether or not training first thing in the morning before you've eaten for people who want to lose body fat uh, is useful but the bottom line is is it's, we, we, it's if you're trying to lose body fat then uh, energy expended is energy yeah. expended versus what's going in so there's a there's a stimulus response type thing that could happen where you know you're not fueled so therefore you're going to tap into more reserves but I think from a general basis like if you like there is yeah. no right or wrong time to train whatever fits with you really yeah um, the only time that probably is not great for a lot of people, but it might work for you, is the last thing at night, right before you go to bed. Yeah. I'd say that's probably the one time that's not gonna be the best, but it might be, uh, you know, like afternoon, early evening, fine, yeah. middle of the day, whatever really w works with for you. Head of day changing diapers and that's the only time that's better than not doing yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you might find yourself training a lot, Stanley, by the sounds of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hopefully that answers your question, mate, yeah. I think Mike's bang on there as well. So what we wouldn't want you to do is to train really late. Yeah. Particularly something that's quite intense. If it's a mobility session, yeah, yeah you can sneak that in before bed, have a shower, go to bed, and you're probably not going to feel too aroused by that. Um, but um, in terms of uh, like strength work, like um, yeah, I probably wouldn't go doing your you know your heavy deadlifts at ten thirty at night. Nah, nah, nah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I, I think we'll go with that. Um, Finn, Finn, okay. Hey Finn, thank you very much for that feedback, appreciate that. Um, your question is to do with exercise mainly regarding weight training. Are you using mainly compound lists like deadlifts, squats and cleans, etc.? Which exercise would be most beneficial for building functional strength for shearing? Hey, that's a great question. Yeah, brilliant. And um, you've got it bang on there. Like, from a strength perspective, definitely compound exercises. Um, so for both records, with a bit of variation in the, kind of the execution of it, we use deadlift a lot, use variation. I think one thing that's quite good is use variation, so don't just, like with your deadlift, look at some variations, so like a sumo deadlift or a hex deadlift or something like that. But we use deadlift, we use squat, so squat variations, front squat, back squat, um, split squat, split squat um, cleans, we use cleans, brilliant for getting that explosive power. Um, where else do we? Um, so functional strength, really, you want to look at getting your hamstrings strong. Um, so good morning, straight legged deadlift, hamstring strong, lower back strong is what is going to give you a lot of functional strength for that. Um, yeah. I, I without think, getting into the specific details. Yeah, because yeah, you, you, can, you, can, you can make this really, like, I think the word functional sometimes leads us down the wrong path. Like Because everything ultimately is functional. Yeah, to a degree. So. Yeah. It's yeah. It's a you sitting in a leg extension machine is functional in terms of that position and potentially strengthening that around that joint, but not really that specifically functional for shearing, where we know you're stood up and we don't really go through much leg extension yeah. at the knee like that. So yeah, I think if you're looking at exercises like bang for your buck, which you 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 kind of got it nailed there, deadlift, yeah. squats, cleans, fantastic. And there's loads of other cool stuff that you can do around it, which really keeps yeah. you mobile and strengthens up the areas that... I think the thing to remember is that when you're shearing, you are, you're using very similar pattern, yeah? Every 45 seconds to, a, to, to however long it takes someone to, take, to shear a sheep, yeah? So every, every time you do that, you're doing the same pattern. 
it's not the worst idea to undo that and do the opposite. Yeah, yeah. because I think we can yeah. get caught up on going, oh, I'm never in that position when I'm cycling or I'm never in that position when I'm shearing, so why should I do that? Yeah, but, yeah. But the opposite is true because if you if you spend one time too much time in one plane of motion, you will get injured. Yeah, I think perhaps the thing to look at is think, okay, what what muscles do I need to be strong at in shearing, and what exercises will get those strong, as opposed to necessarily the the position that you're in in your you know at the summer time. So yeah, a, a blend of both. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Um, um, so I don't get caught up of thinking, well. I'm not. I'm in this position doing all my shearing. I'm not in this position all the time yeah. in my training. Um, and like, yeah. yeah. And you you want to count like you say balance out the body with what you're doing. Yeah. And your your question is like around or well, one of the key words is strength. One thing you haven't really meant, well, we haven't really touched on is con is your kind of cardiovascular conditioning, and actually using strength to do that. So yeah. what we found really really useful is what we call complexes. So they are groups of barbell exercises. So to give you an example, the three exercises you've done, you've given us there, you'd go deadlift, yeah, you might do, let's just say eight reps just for now, this conversation. Eight deadlifts, don't let go of the bar, get the bar up into a front squat position, do eight front squats, okay, and then finish with eight cleans. And then you just see right back in this message and tell me how yeah. your heart rate feels, okay, because that will that'll light it up, yeah. for sure. Um, so deadlifts, squats and cleans can be part of your strength and also part of your uh, conditioning of as well. Condition. Yeah. All right? So hopefully that answers your question. Keep the questions coming in, guys. Really, really good questions. We're going to go back to our list that we've got, um, and we're going to keep answering those questions uh, as well. Where are we? Where are we? Um, so Matt Smith, what are the key aspects to becoming a better show shearer? Key aspects. Yeah. Understanding it is a big one, and a lot of people they go to a show and they come away with a bad experience because yeah. they don't understand why they're getting points taken off them. Um, yeah. You know, and then you could ask a judge, you know, there's always a bit of animosity between shear and judge at times, which yeah. isn't always fair. In, in most cases, it's not fair. So become a better show shearer, talk to the guys that are doing well on the shows, understand, you know, what a second cut is. You know, I know Rolly and I this year, we got together with the wall board in England and we done a, a pre-show course. And the feedback from the people that actually bothered to turn up on that um, was quite good. You know, they all came away feeling a lot better about their um, knowledge towards what they were trying to achieve on the gear level, on how they held onto the handpiece, where they were making their second cuts in terms of the angle, you know, and, and maybe that's something to, you know, and then here I know Rolly's pretty active in what, in what we do, um, and if it's in New Zealand or in, if it's in England, you know, get that feedback to us if you do want that form of help to understand shows better. Um, I don't think there's anybody probably more qualified than Rowley at the, the moment, uh, you know, on, a, on, a, on the last couple of years basis. Um, but yeah, understand it, work hard at what you do learn with, but it, there's a huge amounts to get better at shows. A lot of it is understanding what a second cut is, understanding how and why you're making the second cuts, and then working at angles, gear, pressure, whatever it is, how you hold onto the handpiece, like I say, a lot of people, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot you can do on, into where you hang onto the handpiece to, and an ability to get the angles right. And there's not been a lot of information about that. You know, some guys, whether they, they don't know how they're doing it and they're just doing it very well to, to guys that have that and quite like being where they are and don't want to share that information. But I don't think that's the case very often. I think a lot of it's guys have worked really, really hard, they've got to where they are and they can't really pin out one thing that's been the main reason why they've done exceptionally well consistently in shows, but understand it and then go away and learn the bits and pieces that you need to grow at. And it's, we're all human. That's the biggest thing. Some of us have strengths and weaknesses, you know, like Rolly's a lot taller, I'm a lot shorter, Johnny K shorter, um, David Buick a bit taller than me, you know, guys that are doing very, very well at the shows at the moment. Um, you know, Gavin much sort of somewhere in between. So everybody can do it but it's just finding your strengths and your weaknesses through understanding what the judges are looking at, what what you need to be trying to achieve, and then going away and working at, you, at what you're doing. Yeah. 
how can we improve the stresses of catching and dragging the sheep from the pen and twisting stresses on our mid back and subscapular muscles? Uh, so, Matt, anything? <coughs> it's a balance. As in the like the practical aspect, and we'll touch on some training stuff yeah. in a minute. Like, definitely notice the training ability. Yeah. You know, which you guys will touch on, obviously. Yeah. That was a big thing for me. You know, the 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 strength side of things that we've never perceived to be positive in shearing. You know, we were always cardio based when we trained. You know, we swam a lot, we ran a lot, we we cycled a lot, but. That didn't help us in the, the outside bits of strength because we don't look at those bits when we're shearing, you know, we're bent over, your cores, your hams, everything, but you're not looking at the, that little bit, that 10 second point where it's a whole different group of muscles. Um, and then there's an element of stockmanship in terms of, you know, there's an easy way and a hard way to catch a sheep and there's always a difficult sheep from time to time for sure. You know, you open the door and there it is, it's hitting you in the chest or, or one that's gone and stuck its head right down in the corner wedged in between everything else and it's a big physical load to get out so it's how pick your sheep you know um, ideally try not to let the catching pen get full i know that's not always in your control uh, empty sorry it's not always in your control but you know picking your she sheep the simple things like using the side of the catching pen to to assist yourself rather than putting all of that load on your lower back um, you know one arm around the lower part of the brisket simple things like grabbing low around the brisket, you know, that sheep's gonna naturally wanna come up. The higher you go up that neck, you're trying to pull that sheep over and it's gonna really resist that. So if you can, you know, simple things, you know, hand on the side of the rail, whatever hand you favor, whatever side of the catching pen the sheep's on, grab that sheep low around the brisket, or if it's too big, you know, a simple standing alongside the sheep, twisting the head, pulling the flank in towards you, dropping the butt on the ground. And that, you know, after that, you're choosing to be more physical and again, you know, there's always that element of sheep being a little bit obstinate, but there's an easy way and a hard way to do things and being stubborn and ignorant isn't always the winning, winning form. Yeah. Um, so I think from a, from a movement perspective, um, I would say try and, you know, obviously if you're not already doing some, some strength and some mobility exercises, then you should be. Um, but if you are already, some things that are both double arm and single arm yeah. um, in a rowing form. So a lot of what goes on in the majority of that time when you're shearing a sheep is happening very much in front of you and forwards, yeah? That particular movement, which is probably the most strength demanding part of all of it, mm. yeah. tell me yeah. if I'm wrong, yeah, yeah, for sure. but you're pulling that sheep out which weighs however heavy it is. And I've seen some big sheep on Facebook recently, <laughs> some of those like big merinos in Australia, like yeah. 120 kilos or so. So it was, um, you know, you need to be strong. Yeah. And you need to be strong, like Matt sort of already said, you know, you've got one arm somewhere and another arm doing something else. So it's yeah. it's very good idea to do rowing exercises with both arms and do exercises that involve pulling with, 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 yeah, with one arm. So what we would call single unilateral and bilateral movement, okay? So single arm and double arm rowing movements. Uh, yeah, I think if you're, if you're getting a lot of issues in the, like the subscapular area muscles, you're probably gonna be weak in the upper back, I would say. Like if you're tending to strain those whilst doing that, um, so you want to get strong, what Matt's saying, the rowing based movement, kind of in, get strong in between the shoulder blades. Um, look at that, both from a mobility and a, a strength point of view, you want to be mobile in the upper body, um, but also strong. And it comes a little bit back to those strength exercises, if you're strong at a deadlift, then you know if you can deadlift over 100 kilos, then pulling over a 50, 60 pound U is going to be fairly comfortable, apart yeah. from the fact that it's a sheep. So um, I'd say, like perhaps your your physical conditioning on the upper and the upper back is is going to need a little bit more attention. Yeah. Um, there was a little bit on glutes. Yeah, glutes. Yeah. Glutes, lower back. If you think strength. about, uh, I found that a big difference for me. Yeah. Being upper body strong, I yeah. found that was a nice add-on. Would yeah. you guys put that to me? And I've never ever thought about any of that side of things. You know? Yeah, yeah. If you look at the movement, if you've got strong glutes, then that's going to assist. Yeah. They're massive muscles. You can generate a lot of power mm -hmm. out of that, yeah. and in a way, take the stress off the smaller muscles. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Looks like you're talking about twisting, where are we? Twisting stresses on the mid back. Um, so include some kind of like stabilizing exercises. So something core based in your training that's gonna to have to keep you rigid. So then your core is gonna be a lot stronger. So when you are twisting, you've got that there. Yeah. Um, 
just basically you create a little bit more stiffness through there, through there to stabilize when you are twisting. Um, yeah, so, I think that, yeah. Yeah, hopefully that helps you, Bill. I know that was your question, mate. Um, and you've just made a comment there. Thanks for that. I think for alignment of the doors across the board, Drake. Yeah, closed boards are very difficult, you know, and I think there comes a time where you've got to look after your body. The sheep sizes are getting big. Um, there's always an argument with full sheep and stuff. And I mean, I was what, never one to do it, but if it is, you know, if you have got issues in your lower back and it is your primary source of income, then um, maybe choose not to share in some of those sheds that it is going to cost you the ability to carry on earning money. Um, you know, yes, definitely poor door alignment's a big thing on the closed board sheds. Um, we don't see that here. Um, we use obviously a lot of race trailers, which become quite physical sometimes, beneficial in others. So yeah, poor door placement, but you know, as a shearers or a contractor, we've sort of got to stand here and say, look, this shed is, um, it, it's gonna be detrimental to our ability to carry on earning money and, and make that call really. And if you don't think that if you're going to share a whole day on those big fat ewes and it's a it's a twist across and a push forward and you've got a big day next day well is it worth it i can say do you think like if it is a poor setup and there's nothing you can do just taking your time yeah take like, your so time yeah you know, it's not that i know much but just taking your time getting the sheep out making sure rather than you know if you've got a perfect setup and you can hammer it then great yeah. but you know if you've got to take a little bit longer get the sheep out yeah, you'll do less sheep, but if you finish the day feeling a lot better, then tomorrow you're probably going to shear more sheep than if you yes. smashed yeah. yourself on the yeah. first day. And then you're, There's you're definitely struggling. a balance between using weight and momentum, yeah. obviously. But um, yeah, it's, it's been it. Sheep are just getting bigger too. And you know, we're getting better at everything else we do, but there's that element of human physical in a poor, poor situation that we can't do any more about from our level. So it's, it's making your own judgment call on that. Yeah. Um, so here's one, is there anything we could do in training to strengthen the lower back or adjust when shearing to minimise lower back pain due to being hinged at the hips for so long during the day? So Matt, if we go to you, so shearing first, anything you can do to, during the day to kind of ease it or like just little tricks or anything that you've come up with? Um, think about something else does help. Yeah. Yeah, if you start focusing that your back is sore, I guarantee it'll hurt. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and remembering to stand up straight you know, yeah. how you, your form changing a cutter, you know, that was always something, you know, like yeah. where, how you stand, utilize that little bit of time that you're standing up how, when you drink and, and actually physically focus on relaxing those muscles while you do it. I've definitely found that it just takes away that whole amount of, um, what's the one in the muscle, the acid, and, and you know, just by relaxing yeah. those muscles for that brief second, it just gives your body's ability to, you know, deal with that. But yeah, focus. If you start focusing on how much your back's hurting, I guarantee it'll hurt more. Yeah. Um, Train wise. Um, I think a really good idea is just do some mobility before you yeah. even get there. All right. So uh, and uh, question from from Liam, who knows a little bit more perhaps than some of us in the group around mobility. Um, but you know, a few simple mobility exercises, you know, that you can do, and you don't really even have to do them like on the floor. So it's you could even do them at, at the shed when you got yeah. there. Um, and you could do them stood up and, and that will make a big difference to how you feel and then perhaps just before you start feeling things are getting tight just take the time to do a couple of little stretches yeah just to relax that muscle off and I would say keep a we use a lacrosse ball but it could be a hockey ball just keep that in the side door of your truck or in your shearing bag just so that you've got that with you mm -hmm. and then if things do start to get a bit gnarly you can use that ball to release off and we've done yeah. videos mobility videos with that in so if you if you Specifically, you want to know what that is, I'll, I'll send you the link. All right? Uh, yeah, cool. Uh, how would you advise to manage training volume intensity during the season compared to what you would do in the off season so that you're at the very least being able to maintain fitness levels? Again, individual basis and based on how, how where, you know, where you're staying and you've got other things kind of that marry into that, your, your training history, as you've just said. Uh, oh, if we're if you're like real busy season, so you're doing six days a week, eight to nine hours a day every day. You know, unless you've got a very specific goal, you're probably gonna. If you're just doing a bit of mobility in the evening, that could well be enough to to maintain it, like without putting too much 
much more physical demand on the body. I mean, obviously, if you're there for a record or something, you've got to be really focused. But if you're just ticking along, six doing six days a week, a bit of mobility, perhaps a little bit of strength or power stuff, yeah. is going to be enough. You, that's why you don't want to be doing too much because you're already doing, you know, six times eight. What's that? You're possibly already doing forty. 40, 50 hours of physical exercise in a week. Actual, yeah, yeah. actual gym um, and recovering from that and, and probably having less sleep than you yeah. would you'd ideally like as well because of that. So uh, the other thing I was going to say was um, <clears throat> the fact, the nature of when you're really busy with your cardiovascular work, doing your shearing, you know, you do get quite efficient at that. <clears throat> so it is good to do some strength training yeah. where you try and achieve as much work as possible in a certain amount of time. So you... You get both, you get bang for your buck there, you get a bit of yeah. strength work and you get some conditioning yeah. work done. But it doesn't have to take up, like, it could be 12 minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. keep it short and it But it, what it'll do is it'll create a little stimulus for you, it'll, it'll, it'll keep you, it'll help prevent you from getting injured. Yeah. Um, so it's an important part of your routine. Um, and don't get me wrong, like, you could get away with it and not do it, um, but you'll get away with it. And that's all you right. do for a while. Yeah, you'll survive rather than thrive. And that's not you? just in shearing, that's in all sports. Yeah. Like, you know, so I, I mean, personally, triathlon and that sort of stuff. So I would, I would say exactly the same. You know, you, you get away with these things for a while and then they, and then you go, yeah, oh, yeah, I, I think wish probably I a bit more strength training last Probably year. the key thing is in season, your volume's going to be a lot less, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a lot less. You're not, you, it's going to be less cardiovascular. Your strength work's going to be short and, and efficient. Off season, you can put in some kind of longer rounds of cardiovascular stuff with whatever you're doing. You can really use it as a chance to build your strength. So, and definitely muscular endurance. Um, I think basically look at it, is it during the season, pr generally maintain what you've got off season, focus on what you want to achieve and then work out how to get there. Yeah, um, cool. So. I just had just seen another question come in from uh, Jamie, which is, I think is a really good question because actually it's something that we haven't talked about yet, but we did talk a lot about around the, uh, but with the stuff we've done with Matt. So, hey guys, I was wondering how you how you would maintain your breathing. As I noticed, sometimes I do quick short breaths while I'm shearing. Sometimes I do a big sheep, um, soothing breath, and after shearing a sheep. Okay, just a random question about thought that. So I think that's a question really around breathing, and I think yeah. probably Matt will touch on yeah. that first. Yeah, definitely not my strength. <laughs> <laughs> um, if it's a problem I have, you know, it's breathing, and you know, I can even remember on the day, you know, pulling out a big sheep, held my breath the whole time because it was a big sheep and she was under an immense amount of pressure. And then that reminder, breathe. And you do that and that relaxes everything, yourself and the sheep and yeah. So definitely breathing and trying to remember to breathe when things are going bad is, is difficult, but it's definitely a bloody good tool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think find a pattern that's consistent for you, like probably sharing the lot a few deep breaths rather than short, sharp breaths are going to be good because you're going to basically you want to use your breathing to help you relax. Yeah. Whether you're shearing day to day, show shearing, record shearing, you will perform at your best if you're relaxed state. Um, so you want kind of deep breaths in as opposed to short, sharp breaths. Yeah. Um, relax, it will relax the body. You'll then be able to find your pattern. Um, think about it like the biggest thing effort is pulling the sheep out. So sometimes just have a signal. So even if it's when you pull the cord to start, deep breath in, pull the cord to stop, deep breath in and out, something like that, that's just a consistent thing, practice on that, and then you'll get into a little habit of that and that keeps you relaxed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think it's, uh, make sure you stand up right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, like Stand like up Matt right, said, don't, don't try. Doing your cutter chains, yeah. stand up right, few nice deep breaths in and out. When you go into the pen, stand up right, get some lung, you know, air on board. Don't go into the pen kind of like this, get upright, get the lungs opened up. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, I think we've exhausted our questions on there. We got, uh, was there one more? There might have been one more. Um, so there was one from, from Matt about what lessons did you learn from the first record? Because you said it nearly killed you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, to be fair, in terms of lessons I learned, I probably didn't realize until we'd gone through this one. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's, yeah. that's a fair comment as far as like, I was a shearer through ignorance, you know, um, and sure a lot of sheep through that, you know, poor diet, poor everything, and still tried to share a lot of sheep, you know, as a, you know, rightly or wrongly. So what I learned was I did a lot of things wrong. I did a lot of things right, 
Um, there was a lot of things out of our control that on that day, you know, we, we were sort of struggling with wall weights. We went back to the hill. We were we were into the pumice. We were averaging six minute cutter changes. I was changing the comb every half an hour. So those sorts of things, you know, they play a massive part on your physical and your mental ability to deal with everything when you were not expecting that until you found out when the first sheet you pulled out was full of pumice and we thought we'd washed them and nobody sort of said, well, <laughs> sorry son, we've missed the wall weight, we took 400 back in off the hill. But that was what it was um, and it was a positive. You know, we, we broke the record at the time. We didn't reach the goals we all had, but looking back at that, I learned a lot about that was the time that I'd probably at most run the race before race day, you know, more, 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 more. You know, training hard, you know, and, and working really hard and being proud of the fact that, you know, I was indestructible wasn't the case. Um, so, yeah, if I learned anything, it was realising it a lot more by the time we'd been through this experience and then passing that on to Roly and, and um, you know, how to do things right. But at the time, I didn't know I could have done things better because I felt I'd done everything I could. But that's why we're doing this, is because of the experiences that I've been through. You know, I've shown a hell of a lot of sheep in some pretty miserable, horrible countries, cold, wet, and everything else. Um, obviously been through the record. And then to have an experience that was something that I wasn't expecting. Um, I know it's a hindsight afterwards, but I went into that record with a fear of putting myself in that position again. And there was no lying about that. I had a massive amount of fear of not getting to the end of the day, having to work as hard as I would have to work. And then come to the end of the day, and don't get me wrong, I didn't feel like I was gonna go and dance around a pole, but I definitely, within 10 minutes, could have done another run at the same pace. You know, And that, that's a definite um, compliment towards the journey that we took on the ne uh, in this record and the journey that we tried to put Rolly through and whoever else wants to go through it, you know? So, yeah, it was, it, I didn't realise how much I learned until now. I think probably, like, from the outside looking into that, the attention to detail that you put into your record that we that we helped you with, you probably learnt without realising from the previous one. So everything, like, the attention to detail was massive in terms of kind of everything, pen arrangement, kind of sheet, cutter gear. I think probably... You learnt in every area. You yeah. learnt, you learnt yeah. without realising it until you did it. Well, like, oh, actually, this feels so much better. Yeah, you probably learnt a lot more in that first record than you did in, in the one that we. Well, did yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, learn, you learn more from yeah. when it goes not badly, but not yeah. you know, like when not it's hard. hard like when it, it's hard. It was yeah. a successful record, but it wasn't sort of you know we never we never set a goal. We never verbally yeah. set a goal, but I obviously mentally had a goal, and we were a long, long way off it. And, yeah. and the sprint work we were doing leading up to it, we were bloody miles off. You know, the sprint work was you know putting us into the early 600s comfortably and then to, to sort of just fade away it was, yeah. it was quite frustrating but yeah so we're gonna we're gonna wrap this one up in the next minute um but if you do if two questions do come in afterwards well I'll, we'll probably just arrange a, I don't know, a little chat and yeah i know there was a little bit on exercise wise but that's what we're, we're yeah we'll i think what, what we'll do that. because of the sort of like the format of this video here now it would uh we'll, we'll set up another little video that mike and i do to answer any of the kind of like there are some practical questions around yeah. like types of exercises so mike and i will do that in a separate video and put that in the group for you guys so you've got something to look at there to answer those questions but yeah. uh yeah i think hopefully you guys have found this really useful um if anybody's got any questions obviously you know where we are within this group it's quite easy to contact yeah, us that's uh, probably the easiest way then we'll um pop them in um and then if, uh, yeah, and if anything, if anything, Mike, you'll see like in the next week or so, Mike and I are going to be, um, we're going to be running like just a taster kind of program for those of you who are interested in doing more in terms of your mobility. Yeah, um, yeah it's, kind of a, it's a program that's kind of aimed or like a little taster aimed at everyone, but very specific for students. If you've never done anything before, it would fit very well to help improve your mobility. Or if you're a big shearer and you're very busy at the minute, it's the sort of thing that would complement into that yeah. pretty well. The it's, idea is it's kind of there as, a, as like an, introduction. an introduction. Yeah. So if you want to have a go, that'll be there on offer to you guys to have a go at. Don't, don't think that mobility is a weak form of training because it's a massive, yeah. massive tool to recovery yeah. and, and giving you the ability to use what you've already got in terms of your strengths. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. Thanks, Matt, for yeah. 
Get up. Well, relatively late for you. Yeah, it's a bit of a lack, lackluster sleep night. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks, Mike, as well. Yeah. Appreciate your time. And uh, if anybody needs anything, you can let us know on the on the, on the group here. All right. Great. Have a good day. Thanks, Cheers, guys. guys.